Hello, how are you? Hi, good, late, sorry. That's, That's okay. okay, we were trying to figure out Bert and Ernie. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, they're fighting over things that have no genitals, so... That's what I tried to say. There's no answer. No. Yeah, are they cares? homosexual? Yeah, well, it's silly. I don't know, you'd have to have genitals to be anything. Yeah. So what's the thing? Yeah. But of course, people will fight over puppets being gay, because, you know, that's where we live right now. Even the people who are like, well, no, because homosexuality is a mentality. It's cool. That's fine. They have no brains either. They're just puppets. <laughs> they have, there's no, puppets. There's no brains or genitals. <laughs> It's, so it's unbelievable. Yeah. So Plus, there's... you know, they were they don't really dress that well. I really don't think they're. That's yeah. the other. Thing. You don't think gay people wear the same clothes every day for forty years? Yeah, that just never happened. No. It's never happened. No, it wouldn't happen. No, it wouldn't happen. It makes no Although sense. Although the hair is pretty good, I don't know. Do you mean Sam's? No, the oh, puppets. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I don't think you and I have ever met. Hi, it's nice to meet Hi, you. Hi, I'm such a fan. It's oh, great to meet you and you as well. But I mean, as far as stand up, this guy. Jim is more accomplished in stand up than me. But yeah. it's weird when you've been hearing about somebody and you hearing know, your name you for 25 like years. Met. I know. We maybe because, we have, but. But do, all comics feel like, you know, everyone thinks we live in a big house together. Yeah. Which we actually do. Yeah. And uh, it feels like I, I mean, I feel like I know you. I feel like we've had to have met, but I'm sure we haven't. And uh, you, you, uh, the first, you were the first uh, woman to have a, a special, which was really interesting that you had to push them for that I didn't push them I had to do it myself right. I mean I begged for two years it was never going to happen and I met a guy who was a really good producer and director and he said you know if you have any money at all we can do this and I had a tiny little bit no credit cards I was so young and we did it and they still what didn't is it, buy what it. is a tiny little bit I had ten thousand dollars in the bank in those days. Those um, those specials were costing three hundred and fifty thousand, and I had been at stand up for twelve years. I had a little apartment that I rented. I had nothing, you know, and uh, ten thousand dollars was twelve years of savings in stand up in those days. And you said we're going all in. Yeah, all in. Mm -hmm. You know, and where'd he, you shoot it? Uh, bottom line in New York. Okay, which remember those days? Sure. Yeah, I know the club. I don't think I ever worked there, but oh wow, that was a great club. Yeah, that when that when that closed, that was pretty sad. What years were you? at the improv I was the doorman from 73 to 76 I was Danny Aiello was the doorman before me good actor and then he quit and I became the doorman first I was a waitress when they realized I couldn't carry anything successfully <laughs> <laughs> I said there's got to be something you could do here where you don't carry things so I had the best two in New York and uh, did that for three so years. you would see like prior coming in and out of there oh god yeah I mean I think I got good fast because I, I was there seven nights a week from six till four in the morning and I had to stand there and I, I mean, I can still do every act I've ever seen because I saw them over and over again. And it wow. just made me really good. I wasn't going to be a comic or anything. It's nothing, you know, you aimed for in those days. It just was one of those things, you know, got fired from all the A's and the B's, got to the C's, didn't get fired. That was it. Comedy. Right. <laughs> oh, so you started doing stand-up after you were there for a long time. Yeah, you know, I was 20 and it was 1973. You know, you, you didn't look at Rodney Dangerfield on, on the Tonight Show and say, oh, that's what I want to be. <laughs> you know, it just didn't exist. Right. It was just an act. But when I walked in, you know, in those days, it was the purview of the old, you know, it was old hang dog husbands, older women complain, you know, it was all one thing. And I had never seen a young version of it. And I walked into that club to be a waitress and there was Richard Lewis and Freddie Prince and Andy Kaufman and Richard Belzer and Jimmy Walker. Um, it was incredible. And, and here, and Mike Preminger was a great writer. Then in Ed Bluestone, who's the genius of life, he uh, he had the biggest selling um, uh, National Lampoon cover of all time. It was in those days. And it was a dog looking at a gun sideways. And right, said, right. Right. If you don't Classic buy this cover. magazine, we'll shoot this dog. And <laughs> they didn't have Photoshop then. So it took a long time to get the think... dog to look at me. <laughs> Again, but but he was a genius. I walked in and it was these young guys, you know, in their 20s going, well, you ever notice? I went, yeah, I always noticed that. And I realized here's someone speaking to me. And it was a whole other world of what this art form could be. What was Freddie Prinze like? I, I don't talk to I know a lot of people who knew Pryor or Carla. I don't know a lot of people that knew Freddie Prinze. I knew Freddie real well. He was still in high school. I used to drive him home to Washington Heights. And um, he was 18 when he came in. And uh, I remember... Um, I got him some food the first night and he came over and he had like a little bag of pot and he said, can I pay you in this? And I said, only if you'll buy it back from me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he was the sweetest, kindest. He was a kid. He was just a kid. And I think, you know, his downfall was, well, we all idolized Lenny Bruce in those days, but Freddie wanted to be Lenny Bruce, and, and sadly, he kind of was. Um, he just was so young. I think he died at 22. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he just was too smitten with, but even like right before he died, I ran into him at the Improv in L.A., and he was crossing the street, and he was so loaded getting into his, you know, gorgeous midnight blue Corvette, and he turned around, and he said, hey, booze, that bit you did, and I thought, wow, he's still, like, right on it, you know, and um, it just, you know. Why did he shoot himself? Was it was he depressed over drugs or a relationship? It was or? an accident. He and his friends played Russian roulette all the time. I really, we believe, I mean, those of us who knew him pretty well, we don't think he meant to kill himself that night, and especially because when you shoot yourself for yeah. reals, you put the gun in your mouth, because then you die, but he, it was in the side of his head, and that's why he didn't die right away. You know, that's the Russian roulette thing. If you're really going to kill yourself, you always eat the gum because it blows your brains out the best. Sorry, guys, if you're eating breakfast, but... (laughs) This reminds me of a poster I have on my wall anyway. It's fine. Speaking of which, do you have any coffee with any (laughs) tomato juice in it? Um, So you think he was loaded... And playing Russian roulette. I do. And a lot of his friends who were close to him, you know, he was had such a charmed life. I don't think he ever thought he was going to lose. and I, Or he was loaded and not even playing Russian roulette, just too loaded to know what the hell he was doing. Right. Because I do not think he meant to kill himself that night. And those of us who knew him don't think so either. So there wasn't this thing, even when you saw him like later and he was getting into the car no, and he was all I mean, drunk. It wasn't like this sort of sad, like, oh, oh God, what's no. happened to him? No, not at all. I mean, he's 22. He's the most beautiful creature on earth, six feet, that face gorgeous you know happy like on it yeah you know he was so aware of everything you know and um i just think he got loaded and didn't know he was going to kill himself that Man. night because yeah. you know he did last a while a couple of day or a day maybe but it was terrible i mean you know look you, i guess our fate is our fate it's not like if right. that's your time that was that was it what are you going to do and when you would see like all these guys come through like like uh, Andy Kaufman I, I guess you would watch him work through things and did people before he did taxi and people didn't know who he was uh, what was it like to watch him go on stage where he was not famous? Well, uh, first of all, we lived together for two and a half years in the village. He was like the love of my life. So, you know, that was, yeah, he's the reason I do this. I mean, blame him if you hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Did but, you think you were going to marry him? Um, oh, God, no. No. no we were tw- I was 20 years old. He was 25. Um, no, but he saw me sing. They made us sing in between the comics so people could have a chance to talk in order. <laughs> oh. Because, so, you know, we were so bad. And. And, um, I mean, literally, I'd be on stage doing Van Morrison's Moon Dance, and Bud would yell, "Seat these two in the front." And I go, "Well, it's a mutt right here, please. Night for a moon day, you know, and some butter, okay, with the stars." Uh, you know, it's just hilarious. Just to do because you're trying to like do something where the people can actually be be talking to the staff without being a problem and interrupting the comedians. Yeah, exactly. So he just threw the... Uh, every waitress had to sing. So I learned three songs so I could sing. And oh, you weren't on stage? You were actually just serving? No, I was oh, on you stage. Are, okay. Yeah, but then I, w- I was the hostess and I still had to go on stage and oh. sing. So so I, w- I, you know, you don't know how bad you are at anything at the beginning. So, you know, and I said to Andy, was like we were starting to date and I said, you have to see me sing. You have to see me sing. So finally one night it timed out where he did come in and I was singing. And... Um, I came off and he was looking down and I said, well, <laughs> I was so young. And he said, oh, Eileen, you know when something's so terribly, you can just look down at the floor? I said, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, you can't ever do that again, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, you know. It's devastating. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right, Jim. In the I, moment. I, yeah, hello. But... Did he like when he wouldn't get laughs I mean like I've seen him I'm one sorry of my f- I did digress from your question go ahead one of my favorite YouTube uh, clips is it's Andy Kaufman and he goes on stage and he eats a bowl of vanilla ice cream mm-hmm. and he gets served like the waitress has to come up he orders he sits there he doesn't say anything he just like he's just sitting there as if he's in the audience then she gives him his vanilla ice cream and then he sits there eating it no jokes yeah and then he finishes the ice cream and then he splits he's yeah. done yeah and like people are just like what the fuck like what <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? Is that what he was looking for? Um, you know, uh, gosh, I well, 
he was a genius. He worked on a different kind of level of, of, of consciousness than anybody. He had been doing TM, meditating for like 10 years already by then. Mm -hmm. And he was on such a different plane. And his thing was, literally, he called himself a children's entertainer. If you said comedian, he wouldn't come up, you know, which he told me, if they say comedian, people are going to feel compelled to laugh. And I said, well, I'll make sure they say comedian when it's my introduction. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. <laughs> but, Put the pressure on. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. please. Make them. <laughs> but he really, he just wanted to take you everywhere. And when you asked me before, you know, when before they knew him from Taxi, first of all, he didn't do to his thing for Taxi was he wouldn't be on more than once a month because he didn't want to become just that. So he wasn't that known from Taxi yet, even at the beginning. And they adapted his foreign man character to be the Latka character on Taxi. They came to him right. because of what he was doing. But what he did for people, literally, if... He was done after his hour, and you just brought a focus group in to look at the audience and say, okay, what have these people just been through? Mm -hmm. And you would look at them, they are, you know, soaked, literally. <laughs> they were like laying prostrate, you know, on the You'd say, what just happened to these 150 people? I think the focus group would say, oh, they just got off a roller coaster. Right. And that's really the joy of he, you know, I know we're meaner now, but he had no meanness in him and no meanness in the act and it wasn't to get something over on the audience it was to take them through every single human emotion by the end of that hour and he did and you know you'd watch them i mean i stood in the back it was the most amazing thing i'd ever seen every night and literally at the end they were so delighted you know how when you're going up the first hill on the roller coaster you go why am i doing this why am i doing yeah. this oh my god oh my god and then it hits and you go ah this is, you know ah but oh no and then at the end you go we have to ride again we have to ride again that was andy's that was andy that yeah. was seeing Andy like, oh, my God, what just happened? That was amazing. And just the delight. He left them. They were all five years old after. You know, the thing about I respect about him is the fact that he did it in front of an audience that wasn't always ready for it. Like, he didn't go right. into specialty rooms that they had. I mean, everything is specialty but now. we didn't have anything then. Right. There were no rooms. It was the improv. That it was, was it. And catch. it really wasn't even... We didn't even have catch yet in 73. The improv was this hole in the wall in Hell's Kitchen when it was Hell's Kitchen. And, um, you know, you'd have, like, three Japanese tourists and a couple of hookers came in to rest their feet. And it wasn't like people came to see com comedy. Literally, every comic there, all those young guys I mentioned, had a day job. It was totally... A hobby. It was like jazz or, you know, reading poetry in the village. It wasn't a thing. And you, you, there was no circuit to go on. You were either the biggest star in the world, you know, headlining the Copa and Vegas or with a TV show, or you were nobody who had a day job and didn't make a penny. So the main thing was people would get on The Tonight Show to see if they could, you know, break through that barrier of either becoming a known nightclub comic or a TV, you know, uh, sitcom guy. And that was all there was. There was no place to go. So they there was no schedule. Now it's like you have six minutes, you have one minute, you have two minutes. You, you know, there, it was a couple of guys and I was the hostess. And in the winter, they didn't even come because it was snowing. And that's why I got so good so fast, because sometimes I had to be there to unlock the door. So sometimes I was on for two hours just talking on stage to the people because nobody came yet. You know, Richard Lewis ain't coming out in a snow. Larry David was also one of them. He certainly wasn't coming out in a, in a snowstorm on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock. So I was the go to and it was it was trial by fire but of course looking back how lucky right yeah, yeah. you were there for all that so you would watch prior come in and work stuff out oh my god he you know, it's funny when Tyson, you know, who I, I like Mike Tyson, I really yeah. do. But, you know, before we knew to like him when he was just the scary sure. guy. Right. Um, I was watching someone talk about boxing and he said, you know, Tyson is is kind of an aberration to the boxing world. All the boxers from from since time began were the gentlest souls in real life. They were the kindest, gentlest. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting, you know, and I think like the comics who really are the genius comics had they have two streaks in him but one is that gentle prior yes he shot a car and he had 19 <laughs> wives but there was such a sweetness and a gentleness in this man i don't know if i'm just talking your ears off no no no, no 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 i'm interested yeah. i have a good story it's not yeah. long but that's fine Tell, yeah no these okay, are okay so you know when you're really new you think you're good because you're an idiot or you would never do it again yeah so of course god has to protect <laughs> idiots and new people that's... right so i thought i 
I was good. I'd been doing it for 15 minutes. So really, I had nothing. And so I was emceeing, which I did every night because there's nobody there. And, uh, you know, once Bud knew that I was reliable, he just showed up later and later. So Pryor comes in. So I seat him with his party, you know, four people. And I'm supposed to bring up the next comic. And, of course, being a horrible human being, instead of bringing him right up, I go into my quote-unquote act a little bit. And I am dying like a dog. I mean, it is the worst. <laughs> and, you know, really, if you knew anything, you wouldn't want to do a 15-minute old act you know, right. that you just figured out in front of Richard Pryor. You wouldn't. But, you know, we're idiots. So I'm doing the... I'm, you trying to impress him? Yes, exactly. <laughs> because I'm 20 years old and a fucking moron. <laughs> so there's Pryor. And, you know, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm actually losing inches in height. It was just so horrible. And finally, I said... Is there a flop sweat? Oh, my God. Oh, please. I had to like, take off my shoes and hold them upside down, you know, like the worst. Anyway, um, so I finally realized. And the act is standing on the side just kind of enjoying the fact that I screwed him and now I'm dying, you know, <laughs> as well he should. So. Jim, would you enjoy some, seeing something like that? I, I, I'm, I wasn't there, and I'm enjoying it 30 years later. I'm enjoying you're it. You're visualizing? I don't want to say anything, but you're enjoying it 46 oh years Oh, my God, later. that's right. Yeah. Holy, I know I look really young, but <laughs> hello. Oh, radio. <laughs> oh, no, there's a camera. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so you're bombing while this guy's watching you yeah. die. Now, to be fair, I might not have done it to a guy I respected, but this guy was a very well-known thief. And I thought, I have no qualms about punishing him a little bit because, Ooh. you know, he's terrible. You would say something in the bar and he'd go on and do it. You know, he was such a thief. And <clears throat> Who so, was it? Oh, no, I can't. You know, he's... You Is he still performing or no? No, no. Oh, and there's okay. no well, reason then, to yeah, malign yeah, yeah. someone 46 years yeah, later. Sure, but. Yeah. And he happened to be a nice guy, but he was it was almost like a sickness. You would say anything or he'd hear you going over your stuff and he'd just go up and he couldn't help himself. So anyway, uh, so I'm dying, I'm dying. And I think, oh, I got to get out. You know, and the audience is like, we hope you die. We want you to really die, not just <laughs> die, die. It was so terrible. It's an aggressive bombing. It was. A, yes. <laughs> really, it was. It was malignant. <laughs> so um, so I get to this, to this sentence and I'll always remember. Remember it. I said, well, uh, I'm going to bring up our ne <laughs> next entertainer now. How about a nice big hand for so-and-so? And Pryor stands up. He's in the very back of the room. And he says, hey, how about a hand for you, mama? And he just starts clapping. And he makes the whole audience clap. And I just went... Okay, I'll go wash his car for the rest of the night. <laughs> it's just the kindest gentleman who ever Very lived. Very sweet, but, yeah. Know, That's charity at that oh, point, right? It was totally. He was the goodwill of comedy at that moment. It was you know, on total that, charity. That that note of, of gentleness. I was So I watched the Jim Carrey, Andy Kaufman documentary because oh, I'm a I big yeah. Andy Kaufman fan. Yeah. But it, it bugged me. I thought it was really interesting just watching a guy kind of go into method like a maniac. Yeah, but sure. It bugged me because every story that I've ever heard from people who actually knew Andy yeah. was that this guy who was a total asshole on camera and all these sort of over-the-top stories was not even sort of the guy that was no. off camera. Yeah. So I'm watching Jim Carrey like drive everybody on set crazy and him. be an asshole that's not andy that's right. Jim. and i was like jim is just doing jim jim or tv <laughs> yeah. andy or whatever that's not well behind the scenes andy right you know no absolutely right right Good point okay. and and mainly when people do things uh, of people they didn't know it's mostly about them i haven't th there's nothing that has done andy justice in my opinion i've cooperated with nothing none of the books none of the specials none of the movies nothing i never sold them out i didn't want to hand the the gold i know over to people that didn't know him sure. or maybe less gifted. You know, I thought when I write my book, you know, and it'll be 46 years later, I'll tell all the great stories. I, I did write one beautiful piece when he died. I didn't know what to do with the grief. And so I just sat down and wrote and wrote and wrote. You know, it's just so young. And I just took my little, you know, badly typed months of writing because I just didn't know where to put the, right. the, the grief. And I just took little envelopes and looked up, you know, there was no internet or anything. It was right. 1984. You know, and I just found little, you know, uh, 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 go to the newsstand and look for where you send to these magazines. And I sent everything out and they all wrote back and said, this is great, but we already did our Andy piece, you know, and I, I didn't care. Anyway, Esquire said, we're going to pay Phil Berger a kill fee and buy this piece because it's so beautiful. And so it, it did run. And, you know, I'm so proud of it. It's it's very old now. But, you know, it 
the best le- I got a lot of mail and the nicest letter said, you know, I never got this guy. I didn't know why I should like him. But what you've done is made me love him without giving away his secrets. And that's how I treat him in, you know, the book that'll come out eventually. It's just how the wonder of him without, you know, anything that he wouldn't want out, you know. So you didn't like, like the Milos Forman movie either? I didn't like, oh, Man in the Moon? No. Really? How come? For a million reasons, let's just say that. But you know what? That's just show business. They have to make it, you know, much more dramatic and make the guy sick or crazy. My husband built the doors into the doors. He managed the doors. He was 20. They were older than he was. He literally took a band no one ever heard of and turned them into the doors. And we went and watched the doors movie. And he went, yep. <laughs> you know, we Did he find it to be an accurate portrayal? No, <laughs> not. And that, you know, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Just like when the show Vinyl came out on HBO. Oh. Oh, everyone yeah. in, in um, the music business threw up in their living room. You know, well, like, what? What about the Showtime show? The, uh, yes, uh, I'm dying up here show. the same thing. Comics watch that and go, wow. Well, so right. the point is, it's very hard to watch your own profession. And right. I was walking my dog in Central Park when the movie Punchline came out. And I always get recognized in New York because, you know, it's kind of where I am. And so I start talking to this policeman and, he, and we're talking. And he said, so what would you think of Punchline? And I said, eh, you know, it's not quite accurate. And he said, oh, oh, it's not accurate about your profession. Is that what you're saying? And I said, yeah. And he went, oh, Miss Booth, let me ask you a question. Uh, do you know how often a policeman takes his gun out in a 35-year career? And I said, how often? He said, never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you watch your own job and you're like, oh. Yeah. Just... I mean, on, on, to a lesser extent, it's like like the movie Talk Radio when you're watching that was it. Real, like, that was realistic. You mean well, when at least hopefully the end of it will be. <laughs> when, he, when he's walking around the room and he's not even talking into a microphone. No, like, this isn't... just a genius smoking and talking. Like, wow, that's compelling, man. Right. Put right. your fucking He's, headphones on, idiot. Put your headphones on. It's so busy. But what do yeah. you think of the, the I'm Dying Up Here show? I haven't seen you know? it. Oh, okay. I, I don't typically, uh, yeah. I don't watch a lot of stuff like that. But uh, well, I, Have you heard the characters based on you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the blonde in it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's the thing. The book, um, you know, it had the overall feel correct, but, but every detail was so completely wrong. I mean, the facts were so not facts that my friend Diane Nichols, who's a great comic, started when I did we had a drinking game of like the fact you know what's wrong in it and we didn't even get like past 10 pages we just fell off the chairs and died you know <laughs> it's so wrong and the thing that's bothersome is that A I let him record talking to him and it's the only book I ever cooperated with because I thought he was talking about the strike not us and B he was a reporter for the LA Times so you really should take your news with a grain of salt because if you could get something meaningless wrong like you know just comedy right, then, sure. then what about the news man so it's like, you know, so much was wrong and, and the little things add up to make it kind of like, no, this is off. But as far as the show goes, I'm always uh, glad to see good friends get work like Rick Overton, who's a you know, great, oh, great yeah. guy. And So I'm happy about that. What year was that uh, the strike? There's 82? Strike was 80. Oh, 1980. And, yeah. so, and the legendary guy that jumped off yeah, the roof. Steve Lubetkin. Oh, right. Yeah, great guy. What was guy. that story? Well, the strike was going on and on, and it was terrible. And then she started punishing everyone who, you know, Mitchie. struck. Mitchie. Yeah, she wouldn't let them back in. And he, you know, he just lost heart. He couldn't get back in, and he jumped. And the wow. note in his pocket said, you know, my name is Steve Lubeck, and I used to work at the comedy store. Look, obviously, a strike's not going to make you kill yourself unless you're, you know, weak, you know, have yes. some issues. But it was very sad. It was off the hotel next door. Yeah. He jumped the off the roof house. into the, I guess, did he hit, like, the parking lot? He came, tried to hit the parking lot of the comedy store. Right yeah. There. Well, it's, they're attached, so. All right. That's yeah. a legendary story. Yeah. Yeah, I would say you definitely have issues outside sure. of that. You'd it's, have if, to. Yeah. It, it pretty much ended the strike, though. We were still striking, and then he, you know, kind of like negotiating and all that, and that kind of just put it all aside, and people just stopped fighting. How did that affect her? Well, I think she, it made her stop. You know, she just started, okay, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. So, you know what broke my heart the other night? I was at the store, and just going on, and... um so this really nice girl was talking. She went, yeah, you guys, you know, you fought for money in the big room, but we're in the little room. We don't get anything. I said, are you insane? We fought for the little room. There was no big room. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about, man? We, we killed ourselves for the little room, and we never got back in. We never got a penny of that money. But do you know that now I've learned, and, and it's true, I'm saying it on the air, if you work the main room at the comedy store, you know, weekends for a month, you can make $4,000 a month. That's what we struck. We struck for a dollar a set. And now you can come home with four grand a month wow. and never leave town and and have that. Wow. So we did strike and it did work. 
Yeah. But isn't it funny that somebody comes and, especially now with all the different revenue streams, streams available, yeah. Yeah. like, and goes, you guys didn't fight. It's like, shut the fuck oh, up. Make your, go Man. make your money. Yeah, you know, shut up. Shut that, up. It's the only thing that bothers me about comedians now is they don't, there's no history for them to go look at. Right. You know, you're a baseball player, you watch Ty Cobb, you know, you watch Babe Ruth. I watch him for Babe... social cues, Ty Cobb. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you must have a lot of friends. That's <laughs> that guy. Do you know who I, I, I think is very underrated? Because everybody talks about Pryor and they talk about Carl. I, I, I mean, and Robert Klein, comedians know, is so great, but I, I always thought Robert Klein was very underrated. But he wasn't in his time, so that's right, a good thing. Back then, no. Yeah, but... I used to go see him at, you know, Carnegie Hall and Philharmonic Hall. He and Pryor were the only two playing those venues, and he was incredible. I think he had an amazing run, and HBO still loves him and constantly gives him shows. So that, But I understand what but you're he saying. But he's, he's not mentioned in the top ten. Right, or... He's yeah. not in that. But who is in that rarefied era? You, yeah. are, it's like a handful. It's Pryor, Lenny Bruce, Lord Buckley, and, you know, maybe Lily Tomlin. I mean, not maybe. Lily Tom and Lily and that's it. I Were, mean, who would you put in there? Didn't Dick he love Gregory her? Gregory was amazing. He loved oh, her too. Prior, Prior loved and her. Lily, yeah, they did specials together. Uh, they were amazing. Yeah, I mean that kind of talent recognizes each other, and I don't think they had a lot of fun playing off characters like you guys. So you know, mm-hmm. it's a nice thing. When you hear like uh, uh, this generation of comics uh, kind of getting like, oh my god, this is the the new way of doing business. They're producing their own specials. Yeah, because you hear that now. It's like I, you know, Louis did it, and now a bunch of the guys on Netflix and blah blah blah. Andrew. Uh, Schultz. Andrew Schultz yeah. produced his own special, just put it on YouTube because nobody picked it up. Are you going, yeah, I did that decades ago. Well, That's they're doing I... it because it's a great thing now, yeah. and they do better with it. I did it because I was forced to do it. Right. I mean, literally, I had been on the road for 12 years. I was doing a two-and-a-half-hour show. I was on the road 50 weeks a year, and I still have the reviews. They say, this was the longest and best show we ever had here, two-and-a-half hours, and I didn't even live anywhere. I was on the road 50 weeks a year. I'm not exaggerating. And I would go up to HBO and Showtime. they go, look, nobody wants to see a woman do an hour. And I'd say, I do two-and-a-half hours. I sell out. I follow your guys who had specials in and all the club owners say is great we're going to make our money back this week I mean stop it and for two years I bet no one wants to see a woman do an hour so finally I met this guy you know when we started going out and we got this special in, in the can and I brought it and he said look clearly they're not going to buy you You have, we have to get celebrities and people hadn't used stars as opening of their specials yet they hadn't done these big numbers and I got it was the week Cosby pardon the expression became number one his show brought back the sitcom saved NBC He's on the cover of Time. I had Cosby. I had Letterman, who had never stepped outside his own show. It was the first year of his show. He was m- the biggest star in the world. Dr. Ruth, her first big year of fame. I had Larry Bud Melman, who was so cool on Letterman's show. Brother Theodore, a New York staple of coolness. And Tom Waits, my friend, gave me his music. And I went back up with and with 12 years of honed comedy, like diamonds on velvet, you know. And they went, nope. And I went, Oh, so it is personal. Because I had always said it's personal. And my boyfriend who produced the show said, you're crazy. And when I came back, he said, oh, you're right. It's personal. What do you want to do? Wow. And I said, well, what I want to do, because the way we got it done, he knew everyone in New York because he had just shot Ruben Ruben and Friday the 13th. He said to everyone, we have $10,000. Would you like to work for a dollar or would you like to get all your money once the show's sold? And they said, oh, Elaine Boozer, it'll sell. You know, so they all deferred. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go on the road for one more year, pay everybody and get the fuck out because it's Quick never going to change. Yeah. yeah. And he said, okay, well, we'll go up to San Francisco. I'll teach filmmaking, whatever. I said, good, I'll make wind chimes. And uh, oh, wow. yeah, it was over. And I finally went back up. They had started the Cinemax comedy experiment, HBO, which by the way, I did write and direct two movies for them for that. But I went back up and they said, hey, we got an offer for you. We're going to buy your hour, cut it in half and call it the Cinemax comedy experiment. And I said, I've been doing this for 13 years. You can go fuck yourself. (laughs) And I didn't take the money. And I went on the road. And, uh, you know, the great saying is if someone in TV doesn't like you, wait five minutes. Well, it was actually a year. Mm -hmm. But they turned over. And new young hip guys came in, took it up to Showtime. They went, holy cow. Gave me four specials on the spot. And, you know, that was it. We paid everyone a year later. And everyone called and said, we've never gotten paid by anyone a year later. (laughs) And he said, "We're, we're honest people. We're good.